Right, this is the source page that I shared with you. And we're going to start with the last couple of verses in Megillah. I, I usually use Allah Torah as a website for uh, sources. In this case, and, I, and I'm going to do that today too. In this case, please forgive the scratchiness of my voice. Um, I put almost everything that we're going to jump around in Allah Torah, different for, sources in Tanakh, I put them in the source page, which I don't typically do. But I've done that for today because it'll just make it easier for either you to follow or for somebody else to kind of uh, follow along afterwards. So it's all in order. Uh, but essentially, this is where we left off, which is the end of Perak Dalid of um, Gilad Rut. But after Boaz negotiates with the uh, Plani Amoni, with the individual about the mitzvah of Geula, and he says to him, are you uh, interested in the land? He says, yes. Are you interested in redeeming not just the land, but also Rut, who is the, uh, the, the family of Ali Melech, and to marry Rut and to continue the legacy, uh, right, the, uh, the, the, the widow of Machlon, and uh, uh, to continue the legacy of from the mitzvah of Boaz, a uh, mitzvah of Yibum. And there he says uh, flatly, no. And so Boaz immediately does so, and that's these verses at the end. And what you find is that that's really where the recognition of Ruth's status becomes solidified. And in the conversation between Boaz and the elders at the Sha'ar, at the gate of the court, which represents the Sanhedrin, uh, you really find that acknowledgement, that acceptance of Ruth and her status, if you hear the cadence, if you hear the tension around the status of Ruth beyond, before this point in time, then you really understand what they are saying. This website is giving me some trouble, so I'm going to do this from, well, you know, let's see what happens. The people at the gate and the Zgenim uh, all said to him, Edim, we are witnesses. May this woman, meaning Ruth, be like Rachel and Leah, who built the house of Israel. And really in that moment, the comparison, the connection to Rachel and Leah could not be stronger. Uh, I, I once made the observation, I don't know if it was here, but in a different context, that um, you know, we have a source for the blessing we give our sons. That's a pasuk in Yechi, Yaakov blessing his grandchildren. We have no source for the equivalent verse that we say, or blessing that we say to our daughters. That phrase has no precedent, it's not taken from anywhere, it's constructed to parallel the phrase of, of, of Ephraim and Menashe. It's odd, though, because to Ephraim and Menashe, we're talking about Yaakov's grandchildren, so Rivka, Rachel, and Leah are the matriarchs, so there's an imbalance in that blessing. I've, I've argued that the source for it is actually here, because this is really the only place. It's, it's missing Sarah and Rivka, but nonetheless, this is really the place where that recognition of that blessing is articulated. God should make root to you like Rachel and Leah. Calling of a name, which of course relates back to the mitzvah of Yibum. Yikarel Shem Hamet. Uh, and of course, Vasichayel, we'll come back to in a second the notion of uh, Eshet Chayel. That's one half of the story. And the other half of this story, which again, we've been anchoring, we've been pulling these themes throughout our study of Mikilat Rut is that the other blessing is that this house, your house should be like the house of parrots, which born to Tamar and Yudah, which is a, clearly the direct reference to the story of Yibum and Tamar's uh, a, a attempt to build the house of Yudah. And, um, and that's, those are the two anchors, those are the two blessings that they offer. This Website is annoying me. I apologize for this. I'm going to jump to Alatora. 
is this this constantly pops up and I don't it's in my way so I'm going to do this here you'll forgive me um you can still see it right you can stay where you were I'm just jumping to uh to this uh, page for a moment um Yeah, you're there. Yeah, yeah, I'm just right here. So he jumps straight to the marriage, the yibum, and eventually the uh, birth of child or conception. May his name be renowned, this Redeemer. Meaning, Again, we think about a redeemer in terms of the concept of the national historical concept of of uh, redemption. Here, it's it, the reference here is much simpler to the myths of Geula slash Yibum, but that's exactly what they say to Naomi that uh, this child is your, in a sense, redeemer. He redeems the family because he redeems the family from the destruction that she had emerged from. May be a source of comfort for you, and to support you in your old age. Your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons, has born him to you or for you. She raises him. Naomi raises her, Naomi takes her and becomes his nurse. They give him a name. You let Ben to know me, a child born to know me, even though the child is born to root. But the child born to root is a way of redeeming the family of all of the family, right? The whole family that was destroyed, Eli Melech and Machlon Echelion, and therefore you let Ben to know me, but the Krenashmo Oved, who Avi Ishai Avi David. And can I say something? Can I ask? Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, Ruth is uh, erased, deleted. You know, like she gave birth, and then you know, like even in in Tanakh, you know, it's usually the mother that gives the name to the child. She's not giving the name; it's the neighbors. And when when and then Naomi comes, and it's not she's not mentioning because the role of no because the role no. So maybe they she was never accepted. What I'm trying to to no, say no 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 you can you can you can't you you can't read. Write the text. The text clearly says but she was they, accepted. No, I, I, she's I, not I mentioned wanna, anymore. Why I, isn't I wanna, she giving the name? I, I, I'm, I'm gonna hold. I don't want to rehash that because it'll take us all the way back to a couple of shiurim earlier. But I, after the after the declaration of Yehi Bet Peretz and Kivachel Vekleya, I, I don't think you can argue that she was not accepted. Um, I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue here is that there's a a purpose to the Sefer, and the purpose of the Sefer is articulated at the end of the Sefer very clearly. The Eilat told it parrots. In the same way that Sefer Breshit is structured by this phrase, Eilat told it Abraham, Eilat told it Yitzchak, Eilat told it Yaakov, Eilat told it Esav, Eilat told it Yishmael, right? the story of Sefer Breshit is built around these houses or lineages that right. define the households that make up the Jewish people, that's exactly what happens here. told the, the reference here to the name Oved and therefore whoever Yishai be David leads us directly to the epilogue of the Sefer, which really is the primary goal of this Sefer, which is to reach the point where we complete the lineage of Yudan and Tamar on the one hand, all the way down to David Melech. Ve'ele told it parrots, parrots will lead it Chetzron, Chetzron will lead it Ram, Ram will lead it Aminadav, Aminadav will lead it Nachshon, Nachshon will lead it Salma, Salmon will lead it Boaz, Boaz will lead it Oved, Ve'oved will lead it Yishai, Ve'yishai will lead it David. And so the end of this Sefer, Perak Dalet, ends with a much more positive, a much more upbeat kind of tone to it. No longer is she called Ruta Moavia. Her, that title is dropped. She is Naomi's daughter-in-law. She is the rebuilder of the family. She is the one who is Kirachel Ukeleya. She is the one who is uh, compared to Rachel and Leia and Bet Peretz. Uh, she yelled Tamar Yuda. So she's like Tamar. She's like Rachel and Leia. It's a much more positive um, uh, context in lieu of or in replace of the fear of the the um 
of the uh, Ploni Amoni, the Goel, who refused to do so, pen ashchit et nachalati, lest he, lest he lose his lineage. Here you have the reference to Goel and Yikarei Shemo Yisrael. His name will be renowned. It's all about this child that redeems the household, that redeems the family, and leads us all the way back to Davin and Melech. So from that perspective, clearly uh, the Sefer has a a much more uh, kind of upbeat and positive um, note. It starts with the tragedy of the destruction of Elimelech and his household, and it ends with the redemption of Elimelech and his household and the continuation of a line that would have otherwise been completely obliterated. And I want to reiterate this point because this is going to be the jumping point for our discussion. Namely, that the message of the Sefer, if I look at it from its opening to its close, is that you had, for whatever the tragedies were, whatever the chait was, that's not our issue right now, the story begins with the near destruction of Elimelech's family. Elimelech, Machlon, Echelion, and Naomi comes back without any hope of a future, and the only future lies in this Moabite, Ruth HaMovia. And then, by the end of the story, between Boaz's courage, Ruth's courage, Naomi's courage, suddenly you have a lineage that continues the lineage that continues the name of Elimelech, Machlom, the, the, the name of the family, the name of the lineage that goes all the way back to Peretz and that will continue through Samon, Boaz, Yisha Oved, Yishai, and eventually to David. And that's the the, the structure, the notion that from this near destruction, if you were to look at the story from the beginning, if you were to look at Elimelech's household and the the lineage of Elimelech and say, okay, this line is finished, it's done, and then by the time we get to the end of the story, there's redemption, there's renewal, there is rebirth, there is a sense of hope and future, and ge'ula, which is such a powerful word used to replace the, the word um, yibum, there is a goel, there is a geula, not only for Boaz and not only for the family, for the land, but for the entire household of Elimelech v'yikarei Shemo Yisrael. And that leads us to the question that I wanted to explore, which is the role of um, the role of Yibum slash Geula in this context as a symbol for redemption, not just in the story of Elimelech, but let's expand it. If the focus here is David, so then let's move to the story of David. And I want to take us into a journey into the world of David and why this mitzvah of Yibum or this concept of Geula is so central to the life and the story of David's lineage not only his past, but his future. And to see how central a motif it is in the relationship between the house of David and the Ribbon Shalom, with the Malchus in general. And from there, expand it even into the story of the Jewish people. And so I want to take these concentric circles of the concept of Geula, as it's borrowed here, and expand them, the house of David, the concept of Malchus, and then eventually the concept of, of kingship and the Jewish history as a whole. One of the challenges with the story of David, and we're going to jump forward now, we've finished with Megillah Rud for now, I want to take us into the world of David. We're going to take us into a journey of David's life. Um, if you're familiar with all the nuances of David's life, great. If not, I'm going to focus on some of them that are relevant to our discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll bring the salient points uh, to our discussion. But um, one of the issues that is raised in the story of David is that uh, at some point or another, and I'm not going to go through the whole history, but David reaches a point in his relationship with God that is truly extraordinary. And uh, in the beginning of uh, Shmuel Bet, after he comes to Shalim, after he unites the kingdom, after he brings the Aaron to Yerushalayim. And he has this moment where he wants to kind of culminate all of his efforts in the establishment of Yerushalayim and the Mikdash and the central place for uh, the Jewish people and for the relationship with God. And so he asks Natan for permission to build the Mikdash. You're familiar with the story. 
um, wants to build the Beit Hamikdash. Now, this is, there's a reason he's told, and then he's told initially yes, and then he's told no. He, whatever the, so I'm not going to get into that detail. Um, he Natan comes to him with a message from God that says, "No, I'm going to uh, hold back on allowing you to build the Mikdash." The question is why. So here I want to separate what it says in Divrei Hayamim from what it says in Sefer Shmuel. Divrei Hayamim has this notion where David relates to Shlomo that he was told he can't build the temple because he has too much blood on his hands. That reference is only in Sefer Divrei Hayamim. It's mentioned nowhere in Sefer Shmuel. Um, in Sefer Shmuel, God's message to David is very different. And what he says to him here, and this is why it's so relevant, is... Um, I'm going to jump into the middle of, the, of this Nebuah. From the day that I established judges and leaders over my people Israel, I've given you respite from all your enemies. God is now telling you that he will build a house for you. I'm going to make this subtle, meaning... This is the, what David has requested is to build a house for God. And what God has answered him is that God will build a house for you. Meaning, before you can build the temple or the house of God, God has to establish for you a house in your context. What does a house for you mean? A house for you means a dynasty, means a malchus. And the Fundamental difference between a shofet referenced earlier, shoftim, to malchus, which is now where David is coming into, into play, is the question of dynasty, inheritance. A malchus is a dynasty, by definition. It's a continuity. It's not only national, but it's a national continual kind of leadership. Whereas a shofet is regional, tribal, and temporary in its nature. Those are the two profound differences between them. And so God says to David, Ki yamecha, when your days are filled, avotecha, and you will lie with your fathers, acharecha, I will establish for you your seed after you, mamlachto, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build this house for me. He shall build a house and, and I will establish his throne forever. Meaning there's a two-way street here. I will build you a house and your son who represents that house, he will build the house for me. But it has to come through that second generation. Now, the moment David is promised that he will have an heir to the throne and that that child will sit on his throne, God adds one piece to the story. Because we've already had a melech. We had a melech who sat on the throne. And for whatever the circumstances are, God took that kingship away from Shaul prior to Shaul having a second generation sit on that throne, which means that for all intents and purposes, David becomes the first king of Israel and not Shaul. Shaul becomes demoted from king to Shofet. Lots to unpack there in that sentence, but for now, that's exactly the message. Therefore, ani la'av, v'hu le'ben. To your son, I will be like a father, and he will be like a son. Meaning what? If he commits iniquity, if he sins, I will chase, chasten him with the rod of men, I will, with stroke of human, I will punish him. But, But I will not take my mercy from him as I took it from Shaul, who I removed from the throne before you. Your house, your kingdom shall be for eternity. And that your throne shall be established forever. In other words, that's the message that God gives to David. 
that before he can build the bait, I have to build, God says, a bait for you. You need a second generation. Why that took a, a what changed between Shaul and David? David was David was Shaul's son-in-law. It might have been able to come through that option, but nonetheless, for reasons that are relevant to Shmuel Aleph, it didn't happen that way. And God says to David, we're going to change the relationship, the dynamic of how this is going to work. I will guarantee that your child will sit on your throne to eternity. Now, there's a glaring, glaring two problems in this sentence. Two fundamental theological problems that jump off the page. One is historical. Okay? Where is Malchus Bez David today? That's historical. And we're going to come to that, hopefully, time permitting at the end. But the other is the notion of what the Gemara refers to as uh, almost a free pass for David. Does that mean that no matter what David does, he is uh, the throne is, is, is uh, enshrined and, and permanent? And does that not give him a free, or, or any of the children of David, a free pass uh, to do whatever they want because the Malchus is eternal? It's a very complex promise, and it has moments where it is reiterated and moments where it is violated. And one of the most famous chapters in Tanakh, which I'm going to jump to now, even though it's out of order, but you'll uh, on the source page, it's so much later in the story. In the source page, it's um, source 14, but uh, there's an entire parak in Tanakh devoted, parak peitet, devoted to exactly this question, where on the one hand, the psalmist, in this case, uh, Eitan Ezrachi, starts with the description of exactly this promise. I will sing of God's promise of mercy and kindness. Or for generations, I will make known your loyalty. God said, I will, in, my chesed will endure for eternity. Like the heavens, I will establish your, your house. I made a covenant with my chosen one. I made an oath with David, my servant. What was the oath? That for eternity I will establish your seed, I will build your throne for generations, for eternity. So the heavens will praise your wonders. This is such a wonderful promise. And then what ensues in the next part of this psalm is a description of almost a kind of a, an acknowledgement by David and a thank you by David to that promise. And then, um, if you go down a little bit further, Matzati David Avdi, I found David my servant. I anointed him with oil. My hand will establish him. My, my arm will strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact from him and, and not destroy him. Uh, my faithfulness, my mercy was with him. Is It will be with him. And my in my name shall his, through my name shall his crown be exalted. Right? This is all about David. Who you call me, my father? I who you and I will make him like my firstborn. Which is an exact repeat of this description that we just read in Shmuel Bet Perak Zion. Namely, that even if, and we're not talking about David, we're talking about the seed of David, we're talking about the line of David, I will keep my mercy, my promise of chesed with him forever, my brit, my covenant with him for eternity. I will make his seed for in, 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 endure forever, his throne, like the days of heaven. So that, and we just read this, if his children will forsake my law and not walk in my statutes, so I will punish them for 
but but I will not take my mercy from him. I will not violate my faithfulness to him. I will not profane my covenant. I will not make alter my words. I'm taking an oath to David. I will I, I will not swear falsely. His seed shall endure forever. His throne shall be like the sun before me. Like the moon established for eternity. Like a steadfast witness in the sky. If I stopped here, this chapter essentially reflects exactly those verses in Shmuel Bet that we just read. But this is in Tehillim. And so this first half of this psalm repeats the entire story that we just read in Shmuel Al of Perak, in Shmuel Bet Perak Zayn. And then it continues because it asks the question that I just asked, which is A, David gets a free pass, but more importantly, where is that promise today? God says the psalmist to God. But you have cast off and rejected this promise. You were angry at your anointed. You abhorred the covenant with your servant. You profaned his crown to the ground. You broke all the fences. You broke, you brought the strongholds to ruin. The passersby plunder it. He's become a taunt to his neighbors. And on and on and on, he lambasts Kaviyocha God for violating the very promise that he made. How long, God, will you hide yourself forever? Let your anger pour out like, like fire. Remember how short my time is. For what vanity have you created man? What man lives and shall not see death? Where is your former mercy? Where is that promise of mercy that you made to David? Remember the taunt of your servant. How I, how do I do bear in my bosom the taunt of the peoples? Your enemies taunt us. Your enemies taunt the footsteps of your anointed. At a time when Malchus Bez David has disappeared, where's the promise to David? Now, this psalm ends with a blessing. Baruch Hashem li'alam, amen amen. There is no answer to this question in this psalm. It ends with a question. It ends with Amunah, but it ends with a question. What happened to the promise you made to David? This psalm is so harif, it's so intense, it's so critical, that in the source page, I put a quote from the Eben Ezra, who quotes in the name of a, one of the Chachmei Svarad, this psalm was so difficult for him, he refused to read it. He could not listen to it. Because the psalmist speaks such harsh words against God, against God. But the question is a real question. And it's a question that permeates Tanakh. Because as we'll see in the story of David, there are many times and many places in the story of David where his lineage, his line, his future, his promise, this seems to fall in deaf ears, and, his, and it almost is wiped out. And so ask yourself the question, from this perspective, at what point in biblical history could this psalm have been written? Just throw that question out. In what point in biblical history could this psalm have been written? Well, that could be written post-biblical history. Okay, uh, but you know my my attitude on that, right? But w- what time period in Tanakh could this psalm have been written? And we're going to identify several possibilities, okay? Um, but I want to quickly just run through the story of David and identify this question, meaning 
Well, let, let me tell you the punchline so you understand where I'm going with all of this. And the punchline is that this story that we've identified in Sefer Rut, which is that there is a theme within the development of the, of the house of David, that Malchus, kingship, requires a certain continuity that's not always based on righteousness. So when you have an individual king, a shofet, he's righteous, he's a leader, he's not righteous, he gets deposed and somebody else takes his place. But when you're dealing with a continuity of a kingship that goes beyond the life of an individual and now takes on an identity of its own, then it's true that there are times when those individuals will be unworthy and need to be punished. The question is, what is the status of the kingship, the leadership as a whole? And it would seem that there are times in David's life when a pattern emerges, not just in David's life, but in the, and I'm referring to the life of Malchus based David, the pattern that emerges is one of, you're gonna, you can already guess where this is going to go, Right, is one of Yibum, is one of Geula, is one of the near destruction of the household, generation after generation, until somehow, somewhere, in some act of chesed or mercy or kindness or miracle, somehow it is able to be preserved and come back. And that's really the promise to David. The promise to David is, I will, I will look at the long picture. But there are moments in history when the short picture is overwhelming and the near destruction seems to be all we see. Let me explain to what I'm referring to. Let's, let's start from the simplest example. Okay, let's start from the simplest example. Uh, let's start from the story of David himself. The story of David himself, probably the most dramatic, uh, tragic point in David's life is the uh, story of David and Bathsheba and its aftermath. Now, the the, that, the, the moment I throw out the subject of Davon and Bacheva, we could be here uh, all year. Um, in fact, uh, here in St. Louis, I, I, I spent a good part of almost two years uh, teaching just the two chapters of the story of Davon and Bacheva. So there's a, a lot of information there. Um, I just want to pick up on one piece of the story. You all know the story, right? David, but the, the, it's the end of David's, it's towards the latter half of David's life in Yerushalayim, and it makes the mistake of not going to war, of, of staying back in Yerushalayim, and he, fi and he finds Bathsheba, and he uh, takes her, and then he has Uriah killed. Uh, there's, there's lots to unpack. When Natan comes to him, and Natan criticizes him, and Natan scolds him, Natan says to him, punishes him, or declares, he, he gives him his whole mashal, his whole parable, David proclaims his own punishment. When he iterates, David when after Natan describes this whole story, and he says to Natan, Natan, this is David speaking, such a person who does this thing is deserving of death. Famously, this keves, this lamb representing the uh, story of Bathsheba, he shall have to pay fourfold. Now, when Natan turns to him and says, Atai ish, you are this man, and, and says to him, therefore you will die, and David does tshuva chatati l'ashem, and whatever that tshuva means, David on Natan chatati l'ashem, Natan says, fine, so then God will, hevir chatatcha lo tamut, you will not die, but he does not absolve David of the chait, certainly not. David gets punished, and he gets punished, essentially, the rest of the Sefer of Sefer Shmuel Bet, is the punishment of David. He loses the Malchus, and he goes into exile, and he has trouble, and he has rebellions from his children. And there's one story after another. In the text here, it says, The child with whom Bathsheba was pregnant shall die. That's the declaration here. And the rest of this parak deals with the feel of David to try to save the child with which Bathsheba is pregnant. Unsuccessfully, the child is born, the child dies. It's not pregnant, she already has birthed the child. But the child dies. And after the child dies, we come to the following Pasuk. 
וינחם דוד את בת שבע אשתו, ויבוא אליה וישכב עמה ותלד בן ותקרא את שמו שלמה. comfort bat sheva he goes to her she has a child she call, he calls the child shlomo vashem ahivo and god loved him meaning god chose him meaning god designated that this child would live and this child would be comfort would be be, be designated vashlach biad natan navi vaykachmo yedidya bavur hashem and natan comes and he also names his child yedidya for god's sake this child is the symbol of that essentially we've turned the corner on the story of Bathsheba. Okay, to an extent, because the rest of the Sefer continues the aftermath of the consequences of Bathsheba. One of the questions that the Mepharshim struggle with is the Gemara and Rashi and the Bag and others, is what happened to the fourfold? What happened to the four? What happened to Etakiv Sayi Shalem Arba Taim? In Pasuk Vav. David proclaimed it's a kipsay shalim arbatayim. By the time Shlomo is born, we've only lost one child. A kipsay shalim arbatayim means that there are fourfold. You killed Uriachiti, four people will be killed in this, in, in this place, four times. So where's the four? So here, I, I, I just show you what the Mephoshim do with this, and you'll understand exactly what the problem is. Um, in Rashi, on the spot, says, who are the four? Kach Iralo, the subsequent stories of David's life. He was smitten, punished, by stories of tragedy, of rebellion, of four children. The child who died is one punishment. Amnon, who is, rapes his half-sister Tamar, and then Av Shalom goes and kills Amnon in revenge for it. So Amnon is one who dies. Tamar, who is violated, and her story is number three. And Av Shalom is number four, who dies in the rebellion of Av Shalom. Says the Rabag, how could he put Tamar into this list? First of all, she wasn't killed. And second of all, she was the one who was the victim, not the perpetrator. So that, that certainly doesn't make any sense. And so he suggests that the four are the child who dies, Amnon, Avshalom, who rebelled against David, and Adoniah, who also rebelled against David, and eventually was killed. But that's also problematic, because first of all, Adoniah's rebellion is after David dies, and Adoniah right, is rebelling against Shlomo, not against uh, David. So this whole notion of looking for the four is very complicated. So Reb Maidan is this theory, which I, he publishes in his, in his Sefer, which is absolutely astounding, that in Divra Hayamim, if you look at the story of the lineage of, of Batsheva in Divra Hayamim, we have a different picture. Eilin Noldula B'Yushalayim, these are the children of David, of David in Yerushalayim. Who are they? Shima, Shavav, Natan, Shlomo, Arba, Lebatshua, Batamiel. Bathsheba has four children, of which Shlomo is the fourth. Wait a second. If Shlomo is the fourth, where's the child that Bathsheba birthed and died? Well, that's didn't, he died before he had a bris. He died before he had a name. So he died nameless. So there's actually five children to Bathsheba. There's the nameless child who dies right away. And then there's Shema, Shavav, and Atan, and only Shlomo is mentioned in the story. So what happened to the other three? So here's the theory. Shlomo is not the second child to be born to Bathsheba. But year after year, Bathsheba and David continue to have a child, and year after year, that child dies. One child dies even before his bris. Then the second child dies. And then the third child dies. And then another child dies. David paid, and Bathsheba paid the price for the story of, of, of the Chet, fourfold, four children from, for, for years. For If you think about it, it takes a year, year and a half per child. You're talking about six, seven years of David and Bathsheba's life together as husband and wife, in which every single child that was born that represents the continuity of that Malchus dies four times. It's almost as if this household is cursed and will never be blessed and will never have a child. 
until after it's all said and done, Shlomo is born. And Shlomo is not the second child born. He's the fifth child in line. He's the first child after the first four die. Shlomo represents a kind of turning of the picture. And suddenly from a household which was damned and which was destroyed and which was literally child after child, year after year, generation after generation, right, which was almost obliterated, there's this glimmer of hope. There's this one child who is called, God chose him, he's called Yedidya, he's referred to as Shlomo, and finally, there's a child who represents the comfort and that's what it says at the right. The, the, these two verses are not taking place immediately after the story of Bacheva, but years later, after this generation after generation of of these these the the four as the symbol of that curse of the Kibsay Shalim about time. Now, why do I mention this? Why is it important? Because when I taught this in um and we went through the chronology of it, of it, if you parallel that story to what happened subsequently in chapters 13, 14, and 15, it's entirely possible that the death, that the birth of Shlomo is taking place after the rebellion of Avshalom. And that Shlomo was named after Avshalom. Which comes back to the Yibum concept, the Kareshmo be Israel. Right? Shlomo becomes a symbol of the Gaula, he becomes a symbol of the hope after all of the generations and all the years of destruction. And after the rebellion of Ashlam, and finally David is exiled from his kingdom, and he was literally exiled, exiled from Yushalayim. And somehow, by some miracle, he's able to come back, and then he has a child, and that child born back in Yushalayim. After he returns from the rebellion of Avshalom, after Avshalom dies, that child is a source of hope. He calls him Shlomo. Natan calls him Yedidya. The monument to Shlom, to, Shl to Avshalom is called Yad Avshalom. Combine Yad Avshalom and Yedidya Shlomo, and you get a powerful image of what the mitzvah of Yibum is to the household of David. It's not just about the wife, and the, it's about the symbol of the near destruction of the family, and at the last minute, somehow, some revival of the uh, lineage is preserved, and the house of David can go on. That's in one small story. Right? Now, expand it. Let's move forward in time. We'll move to the story of Yoshafat. Yoshafat is several generations later, and we're not going to go through the whole text because there's no way, we don't have time. Um, but I just want to point out, uh, you can read, I gave you both the Hebrew and the English, you can read it on your own. Uh, Yoshafat's a very powerful part of the story of David Melech because Yoshafat has this essentially four generations of kings in this story. They're all descendants in the house of David, but Yoshafat and his son Yehoram and his son Yoachaz. But you have a period of time in which there's such turmoil in the house of the lineage of David that Yoshafat, after he dies, whatever the chet was that he committed, uh, his son Yoram takes of the throne. He has many siblings, Lo Achim b'nei Yoshafat, but they are all not given the kingdom but rather the kingdom is given to Yehoshaphat, to Yehovah. He's the first boy. Vayakum Yehoram amamlechet aviv vayitchazek vayaharog et kol echav b'charef. Yehoram takes a bold, broad step, and he decides to solidify his control over the kingdom by killing all the other members of the royal family that could take a claim to the throne. Now, that sounds very dramatic and very uh, drastic. But you have to remember that this is something I would expect from the house of Israel. I would expect this in the house of Ahav to go kill everybody who wanted to become a, a, a that could be a threat to the king. I wouldn't have expected it from the house of David. But Yehoram had a weak link. And that is Kibat Ahav Isha. He had a wife. Her name was Ataya. Ataya, I've referred to often as the Wicked Witch of Tanakh. Ataya is the daughter of Ahab, daughter of Omri, it depends on how you look at it, but uh, daughter of, uh, of uh, Izevel. 
and um, Achav and Izevel, and from the kingdom of Israel, and she married Yehoram from the kingdom of David. There's this intermarriage between the two kingdoms. And so the culture of Israel, the culture of Beit Achav, is now swept over uh, Machut David, and there is a reference to the fact that uh, some survival element of, of the house of David uh, survives, Yoram, because God did not want to destroy the house of David. God sends him a letter, Mechdav Meliau, and he tells him that he will die a terrible death, which is what he does. We're going to jump to the next generation. After his death, they place on the throne his youngest child, Achaziah. Why the youngest child? Because all the other members of the household were killed by some marauding army that came through the land. He comes to the throne at the age of 42, and Shem Imo Atalya Bat Acha Bat Omri, his mother is Atalya. What does his mother do? Uh, after that, I'm going to skip the whole story of the rebellion of of uh, of uh, Yehu, and, and uh, he gets killed, is part of that rebellion. And then Ataya, Ema Chaziao, Rata Kimet Bena, when she saw that her son, the king, died in this rebellion, what did she do? She went and she annihilated every member of the household of David, every last member of the seed of David, so that there would no longer be any survivor from the house of David. For the purpose of, I'm going to skip, so that Ataya from the kingdom of Achab and Izebel, the northern kingdom of Israel, is now the queen over Malchut Yehuda because she's the mother of the king whose entire household was just wiped out by Ataya. She, wicked, wicked, the, wicked witch, witch of the East, or of Tanakh, right, she literally obliterates the royal family and claims the throne for herself. And if the story stopped there, this would be a moment in which the entire lineage of the house of David was destroyed. There was none left. And the promise to David would have been destroyed would have fallen on deaf ears, and it would have been ended. That's the destruction of the household. That's the churban. That's the, the, the entire household is destroyed. And then by some miracle, but it will take six years before that miracle emerges, we find that in the meantime, in the interim, there was a sister who took a tiny baby by the name of Yoash and hid him from Atayah's wrath, inside the Beit HaMikdash. And seven years later, he calls over all the Kohanim and he guards the entrance of the Beit HaMikdash that only the Kohanim can get any access to. Atayah can't come in. And he brings out this baby who is now a young boy and places him on the throne. And somehow, after seven years of everybody mourning the destruction, complete obliteration of the house of David, Somehow, oh, a miracle occurred, and somebody had saved the last baby inside and hid him inside the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Kohanim, in the Beit HaMikdash. That's the concept, the promise to the house of David. We may see moments in which this promise falls, seems to fall into fears. It seems to have disappeared. The, the, the psalmist who describes that you have destroyed the abhorred the covenant of your of your of uh, with David. Uh, how long will your anger uh, you have cast off and rejected? Right? You can imagine during those seven years of the reign of Ataya, I can just imagine this Psalm 89 being written during the seven years of the reign of Ataya. Everybody's crying over the, the destruction of the house of David, of the entire Malchus is wiped out. And the, the daughter of Ahab and Izebel is reigning over Judah. Until suddenly we realize, you know what? The Baruch Shalom has a way of leading history into a kind of finding hope 
even at the darkest moments and finding life even at the moments of near destruction. That's what Yibum was. Yibum was Lakim Shem Hamet Anachalato to reestablish the, the seed, the life on, of a family that was nearly wiped out. In the smaller scale of Yibum, it's a family. If you use that as the paradigm of Malchus, it's a way of God saying to David and Melech, in the course of history, this is the continuity of the Jewish people. It's not just about the continuity of the Malchus. It's about the continuity of what the Malchus represents. And the Malchus represents the Jewish people, Jewish history. And so there are moments when we will be feeling the wrath of exile. There are moments when we will feel the wrath of destruction. And like the house of David, we become, it becomes a symbol for us that even out of those moments of destruction, we can rebuild. And the most powerful expression of that is, of course, the story of the dry bones, which I think we talked about once before. Nechezka um, Lamed Zion, where you have exactly that message, namely, that the Jewish people are in exile. They, that's what Lakim Shem Hamet Al Nachalato is, to reestablish the name of the deceased on its land in the midst of Geula, now becomes expanded into the Jewish people to their land. They are in exile. Yevshu Atzmoteinu, Avda Tikvateinu, our bones are dried up, our hope is lost. And God says, prophesy and tell them, I will take you out of your graves, I will bring you back to your land. That's the symbol of the Jewish people. But note the Paraklamid Zion of Yechezko, which I'm going to do it here because this website is annoying me. Um, Paraklamid Zion of Yechezko, which ends with the story of the dry bones and, and, and uh, behold, I will open up your graves and bring you back to your land and give spirit and you will live, immediately is followed the next verse is followed by the prophecy of the two staffs representing the kingdom of David and the kingdom of Ephraim and the reunification of the two staffs together and the reunification of the leadership of Israel under one staff, under one leader. And you will say to them, I will take you, I will take you and I will bring you into the land. I will bring you to your land from all corners of the world. I will forge you into one nation in the land, one people, and now we're back to the story of David. Because they're interconnected. The story of David and the story of the Jewish people is essentially one story. The household of David is a symbol for the continuity, not just of Malchus, but of the story of the Jewish nation. And therefore, this mitzvah of Yibum Geula, which built the house of David, becomes symbolic of the whole process of the promise to David that his children will always have a seat on the throne, meaning the continuity of leadership and the continuity of peoplehood that are interconnected. And that's really what the mitzvah of Yibam is about. The mitzvah of Geula, I should say. Now, I want to add one more piece to the story. We have three minutes. And the piece that I want to add to this is I want to come back to Perak Peitet. And there's two references here that are really powerful. One is that in the description of the promise to David, that is a promise to David and a promise to the symbol of what David represents, which is the nation of Israel. We say, We say, We say, We say, Yaakov Avinu Lomet, we say, right? This notion of this continuity, this eternity to the Jewish nation slash kingship. <coughs> His seed shall endure forever. Like the sun before me. Like the moon, it shall be established forever. The notion of comparing David. Malchus, the kingship, and the, that which it represents, which is the nation of Israel, too. The luminaries of the sky has a really fascinating and powerful application. And that is, of course, you're all familiar with the mitzvah that we perform every month. It's going to be coming up again, Shabbos and Barchim this week, the mitzvah of Kiddush Levana. 
Right? You're familiar, all familiar with the story of Kiddush Lubana, right? Every month the moon renews itself. We go out at the month of Shabbos and we recite a special bracha that essentially takes the symbol of the renewal of the moon as a story, as a symbol of the renewal of the Jewish people, the renewal of the Jewish nation, even at times when it seems like Yechezkel describes that the nation has died and we have the ability to, and the, the promise of redemption is to restore the nation to its land. But the symbol of that mitzvah is not the nation of Israel. The symbol of that mitzvah is Davin Amalekh. And if you're familiar with the text of the mitzvah of Kiddush Levana, which I did not put here, actually, let's let's do this real fast. I'll put this here. I'll show you something very odd about this mitzvah. <clears throat> Uh, I need to find this very quickly. Is it Siddur, Siddur, Trila? Not going to find it that way. I'll do it this way. All right. Can everybody see the bracha? Yeah. Let's see if we can do this. This is the bracha we recite when we go out and recite um, Kiddush Levana. Bracha make- it's, it's a Gemara brachas. Can you uh, make it sure it's very small? I can try. Is that better? Yes. You, God, and your utterances created the heavens, and with your breath created all of the hosts. You created in them seasons that they will not deviate from. They are joyous and happy to do the will of their creator. God, who is worker of truth, who does truth. To the moon, you directed itself to renew itself. As a crown of glory to those born of the womb, who are destined to renew themselves just like it. And the mitzvah of Kiddush Levana is a symbol that we see in the renewal of the moon from the darkest nights of a disappeared moon. It looks like the moon has completely disappeared. And then suddenly there's a glimmer of light, there's a glimmer of hope. That's the mitzvah of, Ye- of Yiba Megola. That's the notion that even though the house of David is completely destro- destroyed, we have a promise that it will survive and that will it will come back just like it did by David, just like it did by Yoshaphat, just like it did after the, uh, the destruction of the temple, as it will do for the Jewish people, that's the Nevoah of Yechezkel, right? This becomes a symbol embedded in the bracha of Kiddush Levana. Now, say something very interesting. What we do he, subsequent to the reciting of the bracha, it's a comp- whole bunch of verses that we recite forward, backwards, not going to get into all of that. But in the middle of all of this, we throw in David Melech Yisrael Chayva Kayam, and we say it three times. That's where the phrase comes from. It comes from this tefillah. Now, where, what's the story here? So let me share with you. Uh, we're out of time. You'll forgive, if you have to leave, this is postscript, but I, I just am fascinated by it. I want to share it with you. So it's going to take us a few extra minutes. But Gemara in Rosh Hashanah. Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi once said to Rabbi Pia, go to a place called Ein Tav, which is a good eye, meaning a place where you can see well, or a name of a city. The Kadshaliarcha said, go there and sanctify the new moon. Ushlachli Simana, and send me a message. What was the message he told Rabbi Chia to send him? Send him a sign by telling him the phrase, David Melech Yisrael Chayvakayam. David, king of Israel, lives in his, uh, and endures. So there's a symbolism that I've just been describing all along. Right? There's the symbolism, and Rashi points out to the symbolism. He says the reason why David, this notion that David's kingdom endures, even though we're in exile, is the symbol of Kiddush Levana is because Nimshal Kalavana, David is compared to the moon, as we saw in Perak 
Tehillim Peitet, Ki Sok Hashem Mish Nagdi B'Kerech Yikon Olam. And the Shulchan Aruch writes, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. We say, David Melech Yisrael, Chai V'Kayam, every time we renew the new moon, we have inside this, we say this bracha, Shemalchuto Nimshal Lelevanah V'Atid L'Yitchadesh, because we have a belief, a faith, that King God, that David's kingdom is destined to be renewed, even though it's disappeared, just like the moon has disappeared. There is that notion of that Moments in history, sometimes there were short moments, seven years in the case of Yoash, sometimes there were longer moments, like when the Jewish people went into exile, when the kingdom has disappeared. And yet there is a hope. After the destruction of the first temple, uh, Yechoniah was the last king of Israel, went into exile, who sat in the uh, last surviving king of exile, because he went into exile and sat in the jails of Nebuchadnezzar for 37 years. right? But by the time he, the story ends, in the beginning of of uh, and Sefer Malachim ends, he's taken out of jail, he sits on the table of Avil Mudadach, he's given honor, he's given covet, right? There's a glimmer of hope at the end of Sefer Malachim. That's exactly the whole story of Tanakh, that no matter how bleak it gets, there's a symbol of hope and renewal at the end of the story. And so we recite this blessing. It took generations, I don't know, I've never seen, I hadn't seen it before, I've heard about it, but I hadn't seen anybody earlier. There was a very famous uh, commentary called Magolia Tayam, which is the uh, Revue of Magolia, which was a librarian, lived in his unbelievable time of Chacham, and uh, he has this commentary or explanation of why the phrase, David Melech Yisrael Chayvachayam was the symbol for Kiddush Lavana, and he makes the following observation, um, he quotes the Gemara, David Melech Yisrael Chayvachayam, and then adds, Kayadua zel bigamatria rosh chodesh. Now, if you want to test me on it, go ahead and do the math. They both equal eight nineteen. The gematria of David Melech Yisrael Chayv Kayam, which is such a strange phrase and written in such a strange way, Chayv Kayam with one yud, right, is the gematria of rosh chodesh because that's the whole message of the symbol of David Melech. And I'll conclude with this observation. The Psik de Rabati, which is also a very late Medrash, says about the mitzvah of Rosh Chodesh, a Chodesh is Elechem, quotes this Pasuk Yerech in Kon Olam, and says, Gehadin Sierra, like the moon, Im Zachitim, if you will merit, you will count to the way, the waxing of the moon. Atamonim Limelayato. And if not, you will count yourselves in accordance with the waning of the moon. If you merit, you will count to its waxing. And Shlomo sat on the throne of God. That's the moon in its full. If you're not worthy, then you will count to its wax, to its waning. There's two more kings there that don't count because they don't last very long. And then Sidkiyah. Tzitkiel's eyes were blind. There you have the moon when it blanks out. What is this medrashim? Do the math. Is 15. Last great king of Israel, it's fifteen. And after Yoshiao's death, went a one-way trajectory to eventually the end of Machut Yehuda, Machut David, in Tzidkiyahu, who was the last king who was blinded and taken to exile and killed. And that's Medrash counts the steps. This is the fifteen steps here till full moon, and fifteen steps here until a absent moon. The notion, the symbolism, I'm going to stop sharing this here, but the message of the story of Yibum, the story of Geula, is interconnected, interwoven into the story of David, 
not just because of Elimelech and this household and eventually the birth of, of David, but because it represents the key to the promise of God to the Jewish people as a whole and to the symbol of leadership of Israel in particular. That there are times in which our history is powerful, empire, David, Shlomo, greatest empires of, of, of Jewish history. And there are times in which that empire seems to collapse, in which the people are threatened with destruction, even exile, even the absence of kingship. But there's always this promise, there's always this give and take, there's always this notion that eventually the theme that permeates Jewish history is Lakim Shem Hamet al Nachalato, to reestablish the line of the destroyed family on its inheritance, whether it be a family in the case of Elimelech, whether it be a kingship, a dynasty in the case of David, or even by expansion, the story of the Jewish people and the concept of Geula, not just a Geula of the family or the line, but Geula of the entire nation of Israel. We should merit that Geula and see the strengthening of the Jewish nation and the leadership of the Jewish people today in our generation and in the years to come. And with that, we will bring our study of Megillat Ruh to a close. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you found it uh, meaningful and helpful. And I'm um, sorry that we had this post for it, but I think it actually has a, uh, a resonating message for as we enter near the three weeks as well, because we're the three weeks are upon us in just a few weeks, from Shiva Sabatamas to Tishabav. And uh, the story of David really is the story of the hope of, uh, and the promise of hope for the Jewish people throughout our history. I will officially close the class now. If you want to stay on and ask questions, I'm available. I'm happy to take questions. Rabbi, thank once, you, thank you. once Claudette's question thank is, you. you might want to look at the chat. There's some wonderful questions there. I, 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 I would be happy to. It'd be hard to read and talk at the same time, but we'll see what we can do. <laughs> okay, Claudette, what was your question? Um, I just want to say thank you for today's study. I It set my mind thinking two things I want to draw my that I was thinking about. Um, when Ruth turned over her baby to Naomi and Naomi became the mother, it brought to mind the situation between Sarah and Hagar, because I thought that maybe that was what Sarah was expecting to have that child as one with her husband, Abraham. And the other thing is that we may be going through a lot of problems right now, but I think we are living in a very good time for the Jewish people, because if we think about it, they united Israel only last seven to three years on the two times. And we've just celebrated seven to six years. So I think we are still living in a good time. And I, I will oh. agree with you there, but uh, a precarious time, and we have to be careful. Yes, uh, this is precarious, but we are, you know, third generation. managed of, uh, to get to seven to six, not yeah. seven to three. Yeah, okay. Um, as far as your uh, first observation, um, which is about uh, remind me what the first look at the the what, the what was the question? It was about um, Ruth turning over the, yeah, child, the child to Naomi, and she became yeah. the mother. So I, I would tell you two things. Number one, it's not uncommon in Tanakh. In other words, if you if you look at it from the perspective of the pattern in Sefer Breshit, you see it, you see it often. You also have the context of Yibum playing a role there. You, Yudan and uh, Tamar is a classic example. Um, it's not uncommon, especially if the mother, if it's the uh, mother-in-law, who's uh, right, she's redeeming the house of the mother-in-law. Lakim Shem Amet Anachalato. The the first says that the firstborn will be called upon the name of the deceased husband, which means that the the, the whole union is the child is essentially born to represent another family. In this case, that other family is Naomi's family, right? Not only Ruth's family. So there is a, a connection back. Naomi is the victim that which this whole story starts. It's Ali Melech, who's the head of the household, whose household is being rebuilt through the act of 
Yibum. So it's not a surprise there that there's an attribution of the child to the lineage of Elimelech, which would connect us back to Naomi. Um, nonetheless, I, I think that Ruth's status there, coming back to uh, the read your observation at the beginning of the class, I, he calls her Yoder Koshar Miki Eshet Chayil At. Right, Naomi's Ruth's status as the Eshet Chayil is the one who provides for. She's the heroine of the story in terms of her providing for the sustenance, the physical sustenance, the spiritual sustenance, the 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 parnasa and the lineage and the right because there's no husband. Um, that is uh, the, when eventually Boaz enters into the union with Ruth. So that's their relationship. But the child represents the continuity of the household of Elimelech. And so the child goes back to a generation earlier in Yibum style to kind of connect back to Naomi. I don't know if I've helped clarify that, but that's my my take on, on, on it. Thank you, Rabbi. No Thank problem. you for the lesson. My pleasure. Um, questions? Let's see what we have in the chat. Um, Thank you very much. My pleasure. Does the check the text assume we know who David is? Yeah, I, I think that uh, the end of the story uh, clearly, it's especially because it's written by uh, according to Chazal, it's written by Shlomo by Shlomo Lanavi. So I think that that's uh, um, that's correct. Um, okay, this is connection between David and Jewish people. I think we addressed. Um, Malachim ends with the release of Yerachim, which is helpful, correct? I mentioned that as well. Shlom and Yedidya, maybe that's where the middle names where that's where middle names originated. Yes. Well, I don't know about middle names, but there are many names in Tanakh of people who have two names. Uh, um, uh, Yitra, according to Chazah, had seven names, so um, that would make for a, a very long middle name. All right, I think for now we will leave it at that. Thank you all for listening. Thank, Thank you for joining you. us. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you very much for ending on such a positive, optimistic yes. message. Thank you. And that was Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I'm glad I didn't want to Looking leave. Looking forward to your next study. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You're welcome.